Welcome to the latest edition of the Omnitalk Spotlight Series, the series that highlights the people, the companies, and the technologies that are coming together to shape the future of retail. I'm your host, Chris Walton. And I'm Anne Mazinga. And today we are turning our spotlight back on inventory planning and allocation, which Anne, you're going to know this when I say it, which is a subject that I cannot turn our spotlight on enough. I loved it for my time at The Gap. It is something that is near and dear to my heart. And to help us with that discussion is OneBeat's VP of Retail Strategy, Greg Arthur. Greg, welcome to Omnitalk. Thank you. It's fantastic to be here talking to you guys today. Greg, you described before we got on the call today, you described where you're calling us from today in one of the best ways possible. Tell our listeners where you're based and um, and a little bit about your background too. Absolutely. I'm from Columbus, Ohio, the demographic center of the country. Um, <laughs> <laughs> my background, well, I, actually, I actually went to school for uh, for math. So I specialized Got my degrees in nonlinear dynamics because oh, as mm -hmm. one does, yes, want to be sure. popular. The party. You need to explain that a little bit parties. more. For, yeah. yeah, for the rest of us here, what what exactly <laughs> is that that degree? Uh, so it's a, a sub branch of math that used to be called uh, chaos theory. It's kind of a sore subject. Oh wow, Jurassic okay, cool. Park. But Jurassic it's largely Park, yeah. when you have uh, have uh, something you're trying to model. When you try to solve a differential equation or a system of differential equations analytically, you get solutions that have, you know, go off the rails with very small differences in inputs. So it's a whole discipline around how do you take something like that and use it to model a system in a way that's more predictable and, and less uh, less sensitive to inputs. Nice. So like Dr. retail. Malcolm, <laughs> retail. <laughs> Do Dr. Malcolm reference too from Jurassic Park. Love it. Love it. Exactly. Um, and so, yeah, so, you know, that's something where most of the people who I knew who did that went into finance. Um, I graduated with the same plan and just happened to graduate into, you know, the foundations of capitalism crumbling or so we thought, uh, but not a good time to go into finance and ended up in, in retail. Um, I, I went okay. first to Abercrombie and Fitch, where they mm. let me be a merchant for about six months before they uh, very quickly got tired of me questioning my planners and moving over <laughs> into planning. Um and Were you wild... featured in the documentary, Greg? I have to ask. I, I was not featured in the documentary. <laughs> I, I'm a little <laughs> bit older than that. I think they probably have more current people. Um, but yeah, so I did that for a while and then ended up uh, spending some time doing software design at a different company before going back to L Brands, uh, where I, I did some more planning activities. Wasn't in that documentary either, uh, thankfully. <laughs> um, and uh, <laughs> Now I'm currently at, at, as you mentioned, OneBeat as our vice president of retail strategy, just making sure that, you know, uh, the way that we're designing the product, the direction it's moving is makes sense with the market. And then the way that we're communicating either directly through our pre-sales process or through our marketing uh, is, is kind of reflective of the philosophy that goes along with that software. Awesome. Wow. So we got a, we got a math nerd with us and that's pretty cool. I know that and chaos theory experts. So uh, we'll try to make some, some sense out of the chaos, which in my experience is actually inventory planning and allocation too, if you get right down to it in terms of how most people try to run their organization. So, so Greg, uh, you know, one thing that I really liked about getting you on this program is you're an operator. You're, you're steeped in, as you described, you're steeped in understanding how retailers, particularly specialty apparel retailers, try to go about inventory planning and allocation. So you mentioned a little bit, but talk about it more overtly now. Like, what is your role at One Beat? What does it entail? And what in, what attracted you to the company? Yeah. So what I one of the things I kind of love about One Beat, um, you know, I, I'm somebody who has obviously spent a lot of time working with these tools from the other side, um, mm -hmm. both from an inventory optimization as well as a planning and buying standpoint. And it's it's something where nobody gets into retail to do data input. Um, it's it's something where <laughs> You know, it, it's a fun, creative thing True. where you have a lot of mix of, I mean, I think the phrase everybody uses is the mix of art and science. Mm -hmm. And the thing that you don't want when you are trying to, you know, service a customer is to have it be that the tool that you're using that's supposed to be helping you out is is actually holding you back. And I think that one beats approach to, to kind of the, the inventory optimization question is something that uh, really speaks to me in terms of making it easier for people to do their jobs, to focus on kind of more broad strategic questions rather than, you know, sitting around trying to set up holdback percentages and stuff like that. Yeah. 
Well, set, set up some, you did a good job there um, setting us up for the the why, but explain what One Beat does for, for the audience so they can get a, a better understanding yeah, really of how we're helping it. in these. Yeah. Right. So One Beat, uh, we, we really look at managing the whole life of the inventory that somebody has. So from the initial allocation through replenishment, through you know, the end of life of the item, we want to make sure that every step of the way, we're really leveraging AI in order to make sure that um, you know, things are initially going to the right places. As we start to run into inventory issues that we are maximizing the sales potential that somebody's going to get at full price. And then also making sure that where it's profitable, that we're moving inventory between nodes in the supply chain to maximize the sell through even more so that you're not ending with markdowns, you're not ending with dead inventory. You know, if you can talk to us a little bit more about that and like, especially as we see more retailers kind of going in on sortation center investments or trying to figure out how to do ship from store. I mean, what are the, what are those like critical components that you're helping them with as they're trying to, to kind of master this? What has to be true for that to be successful for a retailer? It's a great question. So when we think about kind of the way that when we look at a lot of the way that companies are approaching these issues, what they're doing is they're taking what I think we kind of see as the old way of looking at it and trying to apply these kind of new revolutionary technologies to the old way of doing it. So an example of that is a lot of people when they're looking at doing a replenishment really think about it in terms of, well, obviously we need to start with a forecast. When we think about in retail, forecasting from a really granular level, which is necessary to do any kind of inventory movement within a supply chain is really is really difficult because for the most part, when you're thinking about somebody carrying 5,000 SKUs at 200 locations, the odds that somebody's even going to sell one unit per week is pretty low. Mm -hmm. And then you get into the fashion space and you start thinking about things that only have eight, 10, 12 week lifespans. And you're trying, the way that people tend to approach it is they're trying to throw AI at the forecasting problem. The thing is that's that's really very similar to trying to, you know, take a, a rocket and attach it to a horse and buggy. Like we're replacing the horse. Yeah, you'll get there faster, but it's not really the correct application of the technology. Interesting. So with one beat, one of the things that AI is really good at is if you can pose the question correctly, if you understand the data structure that you can expect from a retailer, uh, it's really good at coming up with what is the answer to the question that you're really asking, which in this case is how much inventory do I need to have at a store for a SKU at any given period in time? So rather than trying to, again, do the old way of doing things, we've really looked at it in terms of once we can come up with the ideal inventory everywhere in your supply chain on any at any given point in time through that AI process, then we can get to the questions of, how do we optimize movement between nodes in the supply chain? How, where do we want to make sure that we're shipping from store where the, the increase in labor cost is going to be offset by the benefit in saving a markdown? So it's really a, a way of you know, really approaching the supply chain problem, not from let's make the, the, the horse and buggy faster, but from right. a perspective of how do we really you know, build a car? So if I say that back to you, Greg, is the approach then like, you kind of take the, the forecast as an exogenous variable, like it's just out there and you're not going to get it right. And so we're going to optimize against the fact that we're not going to get that right. And that's how we're going to approach this problem or tell me what yeah, I'm missing. In exactly. That so, we, so we were able to directly pose the question to the AI, AI algorithm to say, what is the correct inventory level? So the forecast is kind of assumed within that. But for the same reason why when people go to look at a forecast for something, what they're doing in order to overcome the lack of data is they're doing the forecast at a higher level and then they're splitting right. it down. They're having to throw a bunch of, you know, outlier algorithms at things in order to get rid of lost sales or overstock or all these different things. And at the end of the day, they're not really coming up with anything better than a moving average, even if they kind of think they are. Um, whereas what we're doing is we're really looking at it in terms of, you know, given all of the variables out there, AI is very good at waiting between, you know, 40, 50 different features and coming up with an answer that says, in order to maximize selling, here's what we want you to have on hand at any given point in time. Got it. Okay. So let me press you more then, because, and this is not, as I said at the outset, this is not my first rodeo on planning and allocation solutions. And, and we've had a number of different providers on the program. So, and, you know, many of them always say the same thing too, that, you know, they're, they're, they can optimize the right, get the right inventory in the right place at the right time. The amount of exactly. times I've heard that in my <laughs> life is exhausting. So, You've started touching on it a little bit, but I want you to go even deeper now. Like, what is it that you're specifically doing 
that makes that happen in the way you're describing? Gotcha. So what we have is something that we call a short term, or a self-adjusting short-term forecasting algorithm. Okay. Um, so it's taking into account all of the different pieces that we understand. So what is the type of product that we're looking at? What are all the underlying algorithms? What is the store that we're looking at or site or channel um, in order to come up with what are all those kind of underlying uh, underlying pieces? And then we can look at what is the kind of time of year. Um, so what is the date that we're that we're considering? And it's able to use all of that in order to come up with what is an inventory target that is most likely to output, um, you know, to optimize around sales or margin or whatever else we're kind of looking at. Uh, we obviously also have the ability to model out any kind of exogenous events. So, you know, everything from your baseline, you know, Easter shift or Black Fridays to promotions, pricing actions, anything else that's out there, and use that as an additional feature on top of the initial prediction. So that short-term algorithm is going to, by its very nature, um, come up with a target that, regardless of how intermittent your demand is, or you know how 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 highly variable the type of product is, is going to be able to come up with a prediction about the correct inventory level directly, rather than starting with we think you're going to sell two on next Wednesday, so we need to have three in the store. And and part of that is you know the way that we approach a lot of this from a, a go to market strategy is also unique in that you're mm -hmm. right. If you go to, if you go to any software provider in this space, they're all going to tell you, as you said, they're all going to be able to tell you, yep. Hey, here's our success stories and things like that. Uh, one of the things that attracted me to one beat as a company is, you know, since 2020, we've signed, um, I don't know the exact number offhand, closer to hundred than 50 different customers and none of them have left us. And okay. from a commercial strategy standpoint, part of what we do in order to make sure people do feel comfortable is we don't lock people into contracts. We don't show up on day one and say, you have to be with us for three years or you know, we won't sign with you. We make sure that people can leave kind of whenever they want and none of them have. Um, and, and a big you know, part of that is our customers are very happy with the results they get. You know, We did a recent case study with uh, a fashion retailer that uh, has been with us now for just under a year and you know our, our implementation typically would go live in about a month, um, and they have seen a reduction or an increase in sell through of twenty percent. They've done that with thirty percent less inventory. So from a cash flow standpoint, we are you know the proof is kind of in the pudding, and that's kind of like a, a median case for us. It's very typical that we'll see results for people you know who are you know, a bit overstocked or something like that come in with much more impressive results even than that. But that's a pretty typical output for us. Mm -hmm. um, and, that, and Greg, that's all focused on the allocation side of things, right? And so, mm -hmm. so and that's really a key point to emphasize here for those listening. So I want to go back though too. So talk to us more about the self-adjusting solution and the short-term nature of the optimization that you're running. Why is that such an important aspect of how it works? Um, well, it's important for a couple of reasons. Uh, the first is that um, the, the way that it's going to adjust is going to automatically kind of take all of the noise out that people typically see. You know, a lot of people like to talk about uh, these types of solutions as like GPS. So they always like to say it's like Google Maps. Um, the thing is, though, a lot of those when if, if, you, if Google Maps didn't, for example, have uh, speed limit information, when you went to pass a truck, it would tell you you're suddenly going to get there in half the time. Um, and from a forecasting standpoint, that's that's what a lot of these do is they think about it in terms of let's look at six months out, what are we going to be forecasting? And we're going to, generally speaking, over adjust as we kind of do that. The short-term prediction algorithm is looking at just over the horizon that you actually need to execute on. Let's make sure that we're predicting that accurately rather than trying to guess what's going to happen six to nine months from now so that we can make sure that we're being extremely accurate within the horizon that you're actually going to need to execute against. Well, I love, I love how you're you're taking the approach to this too, Greg, because I think it makes so much more sense, especially at this, the speed at which things are moving right now, um, especially for those things that you can't plan for. Like, sure, you can, it sounds like, you know, you're set up to plan for those special holidays or for those, like uh, those inflection points within demand. But I think what's interesting here is when, you know, you have unexpected things happen, like something blows up on TikTok and now the demand is three times what it was and retailers have to be able to respond to that that and going back to what you said earlier like it's not about it's it's acknowledging that the forecasting might not be 
the, the thing to focus on, but actually how the, the machine of your, your retail organization is able to kind of process that and, and put the right products in the right, in the hands of the consumers in the right ways. Um, I'm, I'm curious how you are onboarding people. Like, what does that process look like for someone to, to, you know, people haven't left. What, what does that look like? It must be simpler than, uh, than, than most other scenarios. So tell us a little bit about that. It is. So there's, there are a lot of technologies out there that are, you know, when people talk about cloud native, um, it, it is an important point, even though it's not always the sexiest thing to talk about, which is that you can run anything and call it SaaS. So you can run anything on a cloud because it's, it's essentially just a remote computer right. uh, where we're built. We are actually built on actual cloud, cloud native technologies, which means that getting somebody up and running is a really short process. Um, it's also completely headless, so it really truly is something where the interaction that somebody's going to have with it, uh, both from you know executing against our system as well as any kind of ex external data that they need to be able to get out of it, is very, very simple. Um, the other thing that we do oftentimes is we will do what we call proof of value. Some people call it a proof of concept or a pilot, something like that, which is you know if people get to a point where they are wanting to come on board, we can because it's so quick to get their data into our system and getting get you know predictions up and running. We're able to do a proof of value si simulation for them that says, had you been running us for the last six months, here is what the difference would have been in your actual outcomes. And so we're very quickly able to show people, you know, here's the value that we think you're going to get, and because it's coming off of their actual data, you know, it's credible. But then once they get the system up and, and kind of actually working, they, they see those results in their actual business. Like their cash flow improves, you know, very, very quickly. And because of the, uh, you know, the, the types of scenarios we're talking about, that is something where you don't have to wait six to nine months to say, okay, did this work? You can see it pretty much right away in the actual business outcomes that people are experiencing. And Greg, this this solution didn't just come out of thin air, right? I mean, it it is also what the founders correct me if I'm wrong. Like you got tons of experience in consulting, particularly in the footwear industry too, that know what it's like to go into these organizations, understand the problems that they're dealing with, and be able to act on things very quickly to the point that you're describing. Is that right? Yeah, absolutely. So we we actually came out of. Um, uh, a company called Gold Rack Consulting, which if, if any one of your listeners went to business school, uh, the theory of constraints, uh, Gold Rack literally wrote the book on it. Okay. Uh, so it sounds like, sounds like a good thing to bank on. Yes. Yeah. Constraints and chaos theory. <laughs> this is, this is, I mean, this is not just a, a retail podcast anymore. We're, we're covering all the bases. And into it. Yeah. Um, so we, it, it came out of a, and, and they did a ton of consulting, as you mentioned, in the footwear industry, as well as other pieces of, you know, apparel distribution manufacturing. And what they were seeing was uh, very often within the, the companies that they're going and talking to both about planning, as well as all of the execution, um, very consistent constraints in terms of where they where they were falling short with inventory. So I think if you ask most most retailers, if you could if you could choose one metric in your whole set that you really mm -hmm. think would tell you about the health of your business, I think sell through is really the one that we all wanted to get to. If you can hit consistently get 70, 80 percent sell throughs, it takes care of a lot of your other problems in terms of I bought wrong, I chose the wrong category, any of that. And so they were seeing that within their consulting group and their consulting practice and said, look, we we are consistently recommending these best practices to people. And then they're going out and implementing them in custom software or in something we build for them. And that kind of birthed the software division of Gold Rat, which eventually got spun off into what is now OneBeat. And we obviously still have a great relationship with them, uh, but it's, it's allowed us to... Um, you know, use a lot of that experience again with sort of modern mathematics and technology in order to come up with a solution that that really works for the people that that we're kind of uh, partnering with. And footwear is a piece of it too, right? Like footwear is like the most complicated, you know, a category of business in this as well, right? Because of all the right. sizing and everything, and just the variability oh, and demand oh, yeah. across those sizing across all these. All these different stores. So is I, I got to imagine that's also a key component. Oh yeah, and, and I mean even even shops. beyond that, you start getting into stuff with footwear, like um, you know, a lot of the even like size optimization things that are out there. Uh, they look at you know how much should we sell of size eight in the last six months at this location, but that size eight might be in three different ranges. So you've got your whole size ranges, your half size ranges, and your widths. 
And suddenly all of your size curves are overstating what size eight is going to do and understating what any of those fringe sizes inclusive of widths are going to do. And so being able to really understand what are the size selling relationships, you're right. If you can do it in footwear, you can do it in anything. You can do it anywhere, right. Footwear is, is the most difficult and the most location specific. So you mm -hmm. start getting into, you know, we've got one customer in Latin America where they have, if you looked at the size curves between certain countries like Guatemala, Honduras versus Jamaica, they, you wouldn't believe they're selling the same product. Um, mm -hmm. Right. But we're able to manage that because, again, we're looking at all of this down to such a granular level in order to come up with what those inventory targets need to be. Yeah. Or like and, Texas, where they have boots and their pants yeah. have to be longer, too. Go ahead, <laughs> Anne. But that's a real thing. That's a, <laughs> I love that. That's that is a running. real thing. That's a yes. real thing from my days yes. back in the day. Like they I'm sell sure. longer length jeans because of the boots. But anyway, go ahead, Anne. And, and well, that's, yeah. Go. Oh, no. Go, Greg. Go. I was just saying that, that is, and again, going back to this is why when we think about the way that we've kind of, we want to leverage AI, why it's such a disservice to think about it in terms of, oh, we just have an AI forecast is because it's AI gonna talk is about so that. good yeah. at, at coming up with just what you're saying. Like, oh, what is the thing that's causing this to happen? Here's 75 variables or whatever it happens to be. Go look at all of them and figure out what the weights should be between them so that it can understand things like, you do you you are going to need you know longer lengths when it comes to be boot season in the locations where those boots are being sold, um, and you don't have to know it as a as the allocator as the person who's sending the inventory out because that's that's what AI does for people is it comes up with all of that information for you, and then lets you with some information make decisions about what to do with those recommendations. How far oh, out are we? Like that, you got me thinking with a footwear example of like thinking about that product that's in rotation too. So like it, you know, if I'm ordering a new shoe, I'm ordering three sizes and picking one of the three and then sending them back into rotation. Is that product kind of coming back into this, this like planning and allocation tool then too, or is that still way far out? We're still just talking about the, the first part of this where it's, you know, forecasting and, and planning and allocating which stores oh, no. carrying which inventory. Yeah, so that's one of the nice things about it is when we when we talk about it, um, you know, internally we talk about it as store transfers, but in reality, it's a question of, you know, a lot of people are doing that. I'll order three things from online and then I'm going to send them back. So you can look at that in one of a couple ways. One is what most people do, which is they just reconsolidate at whatever DC services their e-com. But because we understand what that network needs to look like, we can also say, what's the place that has the highest probability to sell that size that you're sending back so that I'm very easily able to come up with, okay, well, that's where it should go. So when we think yeah. about transfers, we're thinking about it in terms of, because we've got that inventory model, we can do a lot of cool stuff in terms of where things should go, where things should ship from, all of that kind of information. I love that. I love this whole approach because I, it's funny, like to, to, to share an anecdote with, with you, Greg, and the audience too. And Anne, like I can remember back in my days when I was running inventory planning and allocation for uh, the, the home division at Target. And I can remember saying to my boss all the time, why do you keep beating me over the head about forecast accuracy? Like, like you've got 22, 23 year old kids out of college that are just picking items and modeling them after one another each and every year. There's no way they're going to get this right. What I care about is just making sure the inventory is in the right place, that I'm in stock, and that uh, you know things are selling through in the right way. And shout out to Rick McGuire if he's listening. But um, you know we used to have that discussion all the time, and you're telling me yes, that is not the right way to do things. That the forecast is just going to happen to some degree, and that there's better ways to optimize it given the fact that it's just going to be unpredictable day in and day out. So, so I'm curious, Greg, with that as the last backdrop here, what, um, what's a client case study or a testimonial that you can share? You talked about the, the proof of value approach that you guys take when you go in. You're like, hey, let us prove this out, which sounds pretty slick to us. Like, What's a good example that you can share and what results did you see to that end? Yeah, so uh, one of the ones I mentioned before I can go into a little bit more depth on. So sure. It, it's a, it was a specialty fashion retailer or is still a specialty fashion retailer. <laughs> who, a, um, good point. <laughs> they've had a hundred locations um, and they were struggling very, very much so with um, having a, a lot of markdowns. So they would get to the end of the season and they were really struggling with figuring out what to do with all the unsold inventory. Um, it was starting to get to a point where they were pushing out new sets. So they were getting like kind of intentionally behind the curve on fashion because they had so much carryover that they just needed to get through at a lower price. Um, we were able to go in and implement 
uh, they saw a 25% reduction in their inventory, their unsold inventory at the end of the season. Mm -hmm. So from a sell-through standpoint, I mean, you think about that as a difference between a 50% sell-through and a 75% sell-through, which in a lot of cases is the difference between not profitable and profitable right. on a particular sort. Right. Yeah. Um, it, they saw a 15% increase in their top line sales, which I, you know, again, wow. in a world where a 10 comp will get you a promotion, a 15% aggregate increase in your, you know, overall sales level is pretty impressive. And they did it with less inventory. So mm -hmm. they were able to get the, those kind of results. So we're, well, we're not trying to just drive sell through by tanking your overall sales level. You know, we understand that top line sales are still probably the most important metric out there for most retailers. Uh, but we were able to do it as full price sales and we were able to do it within the, within the course of six months. Um, and, and a lot of that was coming from, as I mentioned before, or as we've talked about so far, uh, reallocation of, of, of items into places where they're more likely to sell. Mm -hmm. So we are able to think about it from, obviously we wanna get that upfront allocation correct, uh, we want to make sure that our replenishment from the DC is going to the right place at the right time. We're not sending unnecessary stock. But then as you start getting to the life of the item, being able to figure out then where is the highest probability for inventory to sell and get it there during its full price life rather than when you're in markdowns is something that was really able to help that retailer out a lot. There's a really important point that I want to tease out for everyone too, like in what you said, like you can't just buy less, you know? Because when, if you start buying less to try to control your sell throughs, like it's going to end up hurting you on the top line and that's going to cause problems. So you, there's got to be a different way to attack this problem. And it sounds like that's what you guys are going after. Is that right? Yeah. I mean, it, it, from my experience, it's possible there's someone out there who's who's going to be like, you, you know, thinks, thinks I might just be a bad planner. But from my experience, when you think about it no. in, in, in fashion world, um, when you're looking at the, you know... Uh, accounting for all of the kind of store-based uncertainty, things like yeah. that, even on an item by item basis, really good retailers that are fashion retailers have merchants and buyers that are getting about a 30% error rate on their buys. Mm -hmm. So, you know, something that was supposed to sell five units a week sells six and a half and suddenly you're at a 30% right. error rate. Great. And there's, Great. we're trying to, you know, a lot of people are trying to throw AI at that problem and saying, hey, let's just keep trying to get that more precise. But at the end of the day, it, that's that's not, you know, tastes change too quickly today. You know, Anne mentioned the TikTok thing. It's like, you know, somebody posts something on TikTok and that can make or break your season at this point. And so what we really focus on is saying, given that our upfront assumption is the buys are not going to be perfect, how do we take the inventory that we have and make sure that it is as profitable as possible? Once you have the inventory, how do we ensure that that inventory is going to make you the most money and not prevent you from buying the next thing. I mean, speaking this, of Lex Wexner, he had a he had a phrase that he or a, a lexism that he used to say, "Less is um, that inventory will make you sick and retail or sorry, inventory will make you sick, but real estate will kill you." Well, nowadays, mm -hmm. you know, in terms of the real estate piece, there are so many channels that people are trying to manage between marketplaces, between their own ecom, between you know retail stores and all of this, that nowadays the, the inventory will actually kill you if you can't get it to the right place at the right time. Well, and especially with AI, like you said, Greg, being applied to all cases here, like I, I have to just imagine the planners who are inundated with this information. And if you can really consolidate this and have them focus on the the secondary part of it, not the forecasting as much, but really the the impactful part of it that they can take action on and can do something on that has to be helping them, I'd imagine. Oh yeah, absolutely. And and it's, you know, again, because we're starting from a place of the AI, the AI has already quantified where things are most likely to sell, where they need to be. It also means from a higher level, you can, you're, you're allowing planners to make strategic decisions about what they should do overall. You know, I have something that's running out of inventory. Do I want to start cutting off stores from it? Do I want to mark it down earlier? Do I, what do I want to do with this? And because you have, you know, already you're, you're coming in at the point where all of that's been quantified for you, you already have every in piece of information you need to make those kind of tactical decisions. Yeah, excellent. Yeah, your point, of, your point about, because I can remember these days, like your point about, hey, you're going to sell three in an average store, you know, across like a thousand store chain. The fact that that's what you're saying creates so much variability in the forecast, no matter how you approach it. It's such 
such a smart point to end on in this conversation. So thanks, Greg. That was great. So if people want to get in touch with you, pick your brain, because it sounds like you're steep, like we said in the outset, you're steeped in understanding how this works and the types of dynamics at play here. If people want to get in touch with you or reach out to one beat, what's the best way for them to do that? Yeah. So for me, uh, we'll, we'll put it in the show notes, I believe, but uh, you can either get in touch with me on LinkedIn, or again, we'll have my email out there. Um, we'll also be at NRF. Uh, we've been selected into NRF's Innovation Lab, which is a curated selection of vendors to who have new and exciting technologies. So I'd be happy to talk to anybody there as well. I will bore you absolutely to death with any of these topics because I absolutely love them. I awesome. hope I'm I'm expecting a drum for, as the giveaway <laughs> for 1B <laughs> booth. I'm, I'm crossing my fingers. I'm going to come by and check or, or we'll just do like our own little like drum circle around the 1B booth. It sounds amazing. Like I'm looking forward to it. Like a McConaughey <laughs> bongo or something. Yes. Um, yeah. Greg, Greg, what is your email address for the audience? It's uh, greg.arthur at onebeat.com. Awesome. Great. All right. Well, that wraps us up. Thanks to Greg Arthur of One Beat for sitting down with us today. And thanks to all of you, as always, for listening. And, beha and on behalf of all of us at Omnitalk Retail, as always, be careful out there.